Hello, good morning. I am Matthias Braun, and today I will talk to you about how LLVM deals with register hierarchies or the lanes in your vector registers and what I did to improve register allocation in those situations. Um, let's start with the obligatory slide about what register allocation actually is. So um, programs in earlier passes of the compiler, in earlier phases of the compiler, use an unlimited number of virtual registers to store their intermediate values. This makes it easy for those early passes. We can do stuff like using the SSA form and actually create a new variable for each assignment. And the task of actually uh, rewriting the program to use the available limited number of hardware registers is left to the register allocation pass, which comes later in the compiler. There are a number of techniques to perform register allocation. It's interference checks. Those are needed to uh, recognize where a variable or a value is alive and needs to be present in a register and where we don't care about a certain variable and can maybe reuse the register for something else. This analysis is used for the actual assignment where we try to uh, limit the number of actual physical registers we use. Usually that's not enough, so we have additional techniques like spilling, temporarily storing a value in memory, splitting. Um, this is often necessary to, um, the splitting allows us to move a value between memory and a register or maybe between registers to fulfill additional register constraints that an architecture may have. And there's also rematerialization. Instead of temporarily storing a value, we may be able to just recompute it. In this talk, however, I will focus on the first two parts. That's sort of the core of a register allocation, which is interference checks and assignments. This talk is about register hierarchies. Most of you probably uh, know them from x86, where there's this thing where you can access a register as 64-bit as RAX, 32-bit EAX, 16-bit AX. The two 8-bit parts of those 16 bits can be accessed as AL and AH. Um, while all the techniques I will present you in the following will work on CPU architectures, they don't bring a measurable benefit, so I am, will not mention them in the talk anymore. Instead, I will focus on an architecture where you actually see a lot of benefits, and that's GPUs. So what uh, situation do we have when we try to allocate registers for GPUs, general purpose process uh, units, uh, yeah, graphics processing units? <laughs> those things that compute all those millions of pixels on your screen? Well, they're designed to be highly parallel. parallel. They have hundreds of registers available, hundreds of ALU compute units available. Well, that sounds like an easy task for register allocation. It is still a good idea to allocate less registers because actually those big register banks are shared between multiple threads that run in the GPU. So if you use fewer registers, you can actually have more threads running in parallel because there's usually enough ALU units available to do that. You can also typically see a mix of scalar, single value computations and vector computations that compute on multiple values at once. And another typical characteristic for GPU architectures is their high latency, high throughput design. What that means is that memory operations, loads and stores, typically take a while, but uh, to make this economical, they also usually operate on multiple values at once. So that gives you high throughput that sort of offsets the high latency that you have for the loads and stores. In typical assembly code, this will, might look like below. Um, so we have a load instruction that actually loads four registers at once. 
Then we perform some scalar operations on parts of those registers, and we store four registers back into memory in a single operation. As you can see here, I simplified things a bit in my presentation. So uh, I left out inessential parts like the actual address where you're storing or loading from, um, because it just uh, doesn't, it simplifies the slides. I concentrate on the stuff that's important for the register allocator, which is the uses and definitions of those physical registers. In this case, uh, the load loads four registers, and they must be in consecutive order. That's one of those constraints you typically find. You need encoding space to uh, actually represent multiple registers in an instruction. And usually, we don't want to make the instruction encodings too big, so we cannot just encode any arbitrary four registers. In practice, it's also often way more than four registers, so I've seen loads of 16 or more registers in a single instruction. And if you consider that, you don't want to encode 16 registers there. What most of those architectures do instead is they encode one, uh, the, the first register, and then say we will load the next consecutive n registers. This, of course, gives us a constraint for the register allocator. We cannot pick any arbitrary four registers they need to be in order, and I will come back to that later. But first, uh, let's review one of the basic, another basic of register allocation, um, that is liveness tracking. We somehow need to record when in the program a variable is live, when it contains a value that will be reused later, that needs to stay in a register. Um, in LLVM, this is solved by, or the representation in LLVM is done by first linearizing the program, so it might look something like that, um, and we assign a number to each instruction in the program. This is again slightly simplified. In practice, you already, uh, you additionally have multiple uh, points in an instruction, uh, so earlier and later in an instruction, but for the slides, it's fine to just use a single number. And this single number allows us to represent any point in the program, yeah, with a single number, and liveness can then represent it as intervals with a beginning and end point in the program. We might have multiple of those intervals for a single variable. In this example, it would look like this. So you might look at the green uh, virtual register, percent one is a virtual register, um, you see it gets assigned in the second basic block here, B1, and uh, lives to the end of that block. The basic block B2 um, doesn't need the value of B1 at the beginning. If you look at the control flow, we're coming from the top where it's not assigned yet, and only at the end of B2, percent 1 becomes live again. Um, you may notice that there's a second pseudo definition at the beginning of B3 that is because we keep uh, those values in, S in yeah, we track each value as a separate segment. Um, it's similar to SSA form. We just don't place fee functions there. Um, so in the end, we have three segments, and yeah, those are stored as a sorted list of intervals. So let's get back to the program I stated earlier. We have those vector operations, those write, load, and stores, which uh, give us additional constraints on what registers we can pick for them. That was the earlier example, and we have to pick register 0 to 3 for the load. The first idea you might get to uh, model this in the back end would be, well, let's use four ritual registers for this and rewrite and start with that program, register allocate, and get this done. This does not match well the existing LLVM register allocator. It might not be a good idea in general, um, because you usually can work best if those virtual registers have no relations to each other. While in this case, we actually have a constraint that they must be in consecutive order. So instead, we choose a different ordering, and that is we use a single register. We construct a special register class for that. I'll show you that soon enough. Um, this 
single register, the single virtual register we use, picks values from a special register class, which uh, as its member has all registered tuples, tuples of registers that are legal for those instructions. In this case, we get all the four tuples um, of consecutive registers. So the register allocator is still uh, back to its normal mode of operation. It picks a single register out of the register class, and we have restricted it to only legal picks. Well, there's one more component to this. We still want to access some of those values in a scalar way. So even so, we now load a four tuple registers. We might actually uh, want to access those single parts of the tuple register. And for that, we have the sub-register indexes. That's those little dot sub zero dot sub one uh, values you see on the slides or in actual LLVM. And they allow you to project parts of a bigger register and access them as a smaller value. So um, how do we construct those? Uh, how do we use those uh, wide registers, those register tuples? Um, early in the back end, we still need to maintain the SSA form, which means we can only have a single assignment for every variable. And well, if we want to construct a bigger value and might want to form this uh, out of four sub-registers, we might want to write those separately. Well, we have some uh, additional instructions for that. It has a pseudo instruction rec sequence, which combines multiple values into a wider register. So um, as you can see here, it's just uh, loading the value of percent zero and percent one and puts those into sub register one and sub register zero. There's also an insert sub rec instruction, which allows you uh, to write a single lane in a bigger register, replace a single lane in a bigger register, and extract sub rec operation, which extracts a single register from a bigger register. This is what you usually use in your code selector to access those registers. Well, as what LLVM then does automatically for you is uh, in SSA destruction, um, Part of the SSA destruction happens in the to address instruction pass, and that's the first place where we can actually have multiple writes of the same register, and that's where we can actually rewrite uh, our rec sequence pseudo instruction to copy instructions. This is still more instruction than, than necessary, but luckily there's the register coalescing pass later, whose uh, job it is to eliminate unnecessary copies, and we will end up with the expected uh, sequence of instruction down here. So now we can represent our program. How do we tune the register allocator for those situations? Let's get back to our simple example. Usually, we, the first thing we do is we compute liveness for our zero and our one sub-register. Um, we can do this here. It looks like that. The register allocator will see an interference and assign two different tuple registers to it. So in the end, we will have used eight smaller registers for those two four tuples. Well, this is not ideal for tuple registers because as soon as we look at the single sub-registers composed within this tuple, we realize that actually none of those sub-registers are alive at the same time. So one obvious extension here is uh, not tracking liveness at the whole virtual register level, but instead going more fine-grained, maybe track it for a single sub-register, for a single lane of the register. And if we would do this in this example, um, it becomes obvious that we can allocate just four registers. If we give this to the register allocator, it won't detect any interferences, and indeed, we can just assign the same register to percent one and percent zero and get away with a four register allocation. In practice, uh, we need to bit, go a bit back and forth. Sometimes we need this fine-grained representation. Sometimes we don't gain anything by it. So um, to be able to jump between those fine and pro uh, broadly uh, grained representations, we have the concept of a lane mask. 
a lane mask is a single number that describes what sub-registers of a bigger registers you're working on. Um, so what we do now when computing liveness, we annotate each live range with one of those lane masks to say which sub-registers we are talking about. We usually start with a complete register and refine as necessary as we find sub-register accesses in the program. To give you a little example, even so, percent zero here has a full load of uh, four tuple registers. There's actually no accesses for parts of that register, so we can stay with a single life range where all the bits are set. On the other hand, as soon as we have scalar operations uh, operating on, the, on a larger register, like the second part of the example, we need to split up our representation, and in this case, uh, the sub zero and the sub three register get split up into their own life ranges because they have different life ranges, and uh, the sub one and sub two registers are not accessed independently, so we can keep them in the orange life range here. Another part of register allocation, obviously, is the assignment of the registers. We do this uh, in a greedy fashion, so um, we try to assign one register after another. We have some ways uh, to recolor or get back to that in the allocator, but most of it, uh, mostly the greedy decision stays, so that's the important part to get right first. Um, as long as we are in linear, uh, as we have a linear program, um, and we just want to minimize the number of registers used. Um, it's actually a good heuristic to assign from beginning to end, just sort your life ranges uh, by their begin position, and that actually, if we don't, uh, if we ignore uh, loops and control flow, that actually would give us an optimal assignment. Um, this problem, however, gets more complicated and I'm already ignoring uh, control flow and ifs and everything else that makes uh, assignment NP complete. Um, another thing that makes assignment NP complete is actually having right registers in the mix. Um, there's a paper out there that proves that uh, in the presence of register aliases, different sized registers, register allocation is NP complete even for straight line code where it was simple without those. Well, if we use our normal heuristics and just assign an order, you will realize that um, we can end up in situations in which we would have space for the right register. So if you look here after assigning from top to bottom, um, we actually have enough space left. There's two whole registers free that would be able, uh, that we want to use for that bigger, wider green block. However, um, those are not consecutive, so we cannot use them and are forced to allocate the green block separately, and we will end up with a six-part allocation here. Well, the tuning we can do here is the re realizing that when we assign the bigger, the wider blocks first, every time we produce a hole in wider blocks, we can fill that up with smaller blocks, but not the other way around. So we tune the heuristics and always assign the wide registers first, and then do our usual top to bottom assignment. And as you can see in this example, we get away with four registers instead of six. There's another thing that needs to be tuned. Um, that's a practical consideration. Um, now that we have introduced all those tuple registers, they obviously have a lot of interferences. So a typical GPU as I said earlier, I've seen loads in stores up to 16 registers. So if we form all those register tuples, we heavily increase the number of registers. That's not a problem yet. Um, but we also um, increase the number of uh, interference checks we have to do for each register. So just consider the example on the slides where we have one R3 register. Now that interferes with two tuple registers, which have a R3 register as well. And if we continue drawing this thing, you will realize that gets you down to the Gauss formula of n times n minus 1 half. And for 1 to 10 tuples, for example, it would be 45 aliases already. And this just gets worse the more uh, tuples or the wider your operations are. So um, to alleviate those problems, we introduce a new concept 
which is register units, because actually, as you saw before in our example here, it's just the R3 register that's common to all those registers that interfere with each other. So we try to capture this essence of the unit that um, creates the interferences for us. So what we do, those register units are defined in a way that every time, so we map each register to a number of register units, and every time two registers interfere, we make sure that they also share a register unit while at the same time minimizing the number of register units. In the examples on the slides, so you just form similar uh, tuples of consecutive registers. This really gives you one register unit per single registers we had. And the situation might look like this. In practice, this uh, dramatically reduces the number of interference checks you have to do and uh, also the amount of memory you use because you, now we track liveness only per register unit. So we don't track and check liveness and appearances for physical registers anymore, but every time we have a request, we translate it to register units first and then look up the liveness and the interferences for those register units. So how do you use that in your targets? What uh, experiences did I have with that? Where can we work further? Well, using it is actually pretty easy, mostly automatic. Um, if you have a target like that, you probably already wrote your register info table gen file where you declared all those sub-register indexes to um, explain how to relate those registers to each other. Um, those uh, register units get computed automatically for you along with some register classes that uh, turn out when you use those sub-register indexes. Um, there's a choice you can make to enable or disable this fine-grained liveness tracking. As I said in the beginning, I measured this for CPU targets, x86 and ARM, and I couldn't measure any effect, positive or negative, in the test suit. So in, it's usually only good to enable those when you have a lot of situations where uh, those wide axes uh, are share or, or alternate with smaller scalar axes to your values. That's the situations in where, where it is really beneficial to enable the fine-grained liveness tracking. Otherwise, it might just be a small bit of compile time wasted that you can do without. Um, the tuning with the uh, allocating the bigger classes first, for that, we have the allocation priority uh, field now, which you can set in your register description as well per register class. I implemented this first in the Apple GPU compiler. That was the first target this, where it was designed for. And in those cases, we actually, uh, I measure this over a bigger suite of benchmarks. There's uh, smaller benchmark applications. There's also a lot of traces of actual games and applications in the GPU world. It's easy to capture the state of a program and replicate only the compilation part that happens for the graphics processing unit. And with this bigger uh, test suit, I saw an average reduction of 20% register usage. So on average, uh, though all those shaders use 20% fewer registers, which is quite a bit. Um, of, as usual, register allocation is an NP-complete problem. There are a few outliers where we actually use more registers. On the other hand, I saw improvements of up to 50% in some cases. Looking at the speed up that this brings, um, not all the benchmarks uh, turned out to be sensitive to parallelism, so some of them might be I.O. limited or have other, re other bottlenecks. So they stayed mostly the same. So the average speed up is only two to three percent. But in those cases where more parallelism uh, helped, where the fewer registers actually increased the available parallelism, I saw speed ups of up to 70 percent. Similar results I heard from the people working on the AMD GPU target. I have no concrete numbers. But back then, when I uh, implemented those things, uh, Tom Stellard wrote this blog post about his work on AMD GPU, where he just enabled 
the new features, uh, machine scheduler, that's not part of this talk, um, and sub-register liveness, that's what this talk is about. And he also saw up to 60% uh, improved benchmarks on his Bonaire GPU and other cases also improved 10 to 25% for him. So what is left to do? Um, there's some technical depth in the area of representing programs. There's situations uh, where we actually need, want to assign a register to a use operand, but don't really care about what value we read at that place. Currently, we can set the under flag for those situations. Um, similarly, if we write to a register and don't really care about what value we write, nobody will read this value anymore, we can set a dead definition flag on the register. The problem here is that as soon as we introduce write registers, we come into a lot of situations where we have partially undefined or partially dead registers. And now, currently, we cannot mark those in the operands of the machine instruction. And we have to jump to several hoops in liveness calculation to still figure out which values are partially undefined or partially dead. It would simplify the code a lot, make it a bit more robust if we could somehow extend the machine operands to maybe have a lane mask to track which parts are undefined and which parts are dead. In practice, uh, we still have to figure out how to do that without heavily increasing the memory usage for every other target. So that's why this wasn't just added yet to the machine operand. Another area to work on, especially in the context of GPUs, um, is somehow doing more splitting and rematerialization. Um, as I said earlier, with hundreds of registers available, you usually don't run in situations where you need to actually spill values. Um, usually the register allocator helps with the splitting and rematerialization mitigation techniques until it actually has to spill. It might be a good idea to do this earlier for GPU targets to still reduce the number of registers. Even so, we wouldn't need to spill yet. The spill code itself is not updated for uh, sub-register liveness, so currently we always spill a complete virtual register. It might make sense if there's only half a wide register alive to use a sequence of smaller stores or some special store to only spill part of the register. There's another part in the scheduler where we track register pressure, the amount of registers that we predict will be used by the register allocator later. This register pressure estimation currently also only operates on complete virtual registers and doesn't uh, catch the cases where maybe only half a wide register is alive. And then we will get some two conservative estimations where in practice maybe less registers would be actually alive at that point. There are also some peculiar interactions uh, when we start packing all those values into wider registers. Um, because typically we have an SSA form earlier in the back end, and SSA form has this property that use def relationships are obvious and easy to follow. You can do stuff like bad code elimination. If there's no immediate use of a value, is it bad? I can remove it. And as soon as we start packing multiple values into wider registers, we somewhat uh, obscure the use def relationships for the lanes inside the register. So a number of uh, optimization techniques we have in the back end, especially smaller people, people uh, optimizations may need further updates to uh, improve in the presence of wider registers. Some of that is already in tree, actually, so you might see the detect dead lane masks pass or um, the split independent subregist pass, um, which I don't have time to talk about, unfortunately, now. Um, but those uh, deal with some of the problem problems in this area, but there's more we can work on. That's it for my talk. Any questions? I'll bring the microphone to you, or you can also go to the one in the center there. Do you document those passes that you weren't able to talk about today uh, somewhere? 
that we can take a look at, like the lane mask? Um, and, uh, like most passes, they have extensive doc or <laughs> a longer <laughs> documentation comments at the beginning of the passes, so uh, you can learn about that there. Um, yeah. In principle, you they are enabled by default as soon as your target uses subregister, uh, has subregister liveness tracking enabled. So yeah, you can just see how they work, what effect they have. And maybe we can also follow this up on the mailing list if you have additional questions. Uh, in, in the beginning of uh, the presentation, you mentioned x86. So, have you enabled for x86 subregisters, like you mentioned, for EAX or with yeah. subregisters? So, uh, the only opportunity on x86 in the integer registers is AL and AH, uh, so packing two 8 bit values into a single bigger value. And um, this rarely happens in LLVM that we actually represent an 8-bit value in an 8-bit register because Intel itself recommends uh, to rather use the full 32-bit register where possible, even if you only compute a smaller value, because that's better for the out-of-order engine as far as I know. So that's why LLVM rarely uses those small values. And I think I found 10 opportunities in the whole test suit where this trig actually triggered and changed the code that was generated, and none of those was in any hot code or looked interesting in any way. So that's why it's not enabled for CPU targets. Okay, but there is an ability to easily enable this, right? Yeah, you can just flip the switch, and you will mostly see no change. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, thank you. Any other questions? Okay, thank you guys.